If you've ever heard people talking about the golden age or the silver age and you had no idea what they were talking about, this video is for you. What's up guys, I'm BJ Kicks. I buy comics, I read them, and I review them all for your viewing pleasure. And this is another episode of Comics 101, the show where I teach you everything that I wish I knew when I first got into comics two years ago. Now, this episode is a bit of a history lesson, or let's not bury the lead, it's a lot of a history lesson. Now, when I first started buying comics, I kind of bought them at random. I would buy, you know, whatever the new issues were, for the week. Sometimes I will browse the back issue bins for covers that I thought looked cool or were interesting. And you know, of course, eventually you start meeting people in the hobby and they start asking you, well, what do you collect? You collect golden age, bronze age, silver age, modern books. And you know, you got to be that guy that pretends to know what they're talking about while you just say, oh, whatever looks interesting. Now, besides looking like you know what you're talking about in the comic shop, I think it's super important to understand the different eras of comic books and eras of collecting so that you know what you might be interested in and where to start looking for some of these really cool books. Now, let's go ahead and get started. So, like I said, a lot of people are familiar with the terminology, even if they don't know what it means, right? The golden age of comics, the silver age of comics, the bronze age. We're going to talk about all of it. I'm going to tell you what years they started, where they finished, and what types of books you can expect to see from each of those eras. Now, comics have been around since the early 1930s. I think 1933 is the year that we first start, uh, we see the first actual comic book. It's called Famous Funnies. Now, prior to this, comics did live uh, in newspapers as, as comic strips and things like that, which, interestingly enough, is how I was introduced to comics, right? My favorites in the newspaper were Peanuts and Dennis the Menace, but that's a story for another day. Now, uh, the comics really kind of take off in 1938, which is the year that marks the beginning of the Golden Age. Now, the Golden Age of comics lasts from 1938 until about 1950. And what really marks the Golden Age is the rise and po in popularity of superheroes. And it all starts with the very first superhero published in comic books, Superman. So Superman makes his debut in Action Comics number one um, way back in 1938 and is just hugely popular out of the gate. People love it. You know, maybe not so much now, but people love Superman, right? Now, you also have a bunch of other superheroes popping up at this time after, you know, Superman gets so popular. So it's fair to say without Superman, you get None of these other characters, but Batman, Wonder Woman, Captain America, they all make their debuts in 1941. Um, and you know, you know the rest. I mean, there are so many characters. The Green Lantern, um, there, there's a bunch of characters. Aquaman, The Flash, all those characters make their debuts uh, sometime between 1938 and 1950. And like I said, this is the golden age of comics. Um, now, of course, during this time uh, is World War II in, in the early 1940s, right? And during World War II, we have the Industrial Revolution. It really kind of jump-started us out of the Great Depression and into a time of prosperity in the country. Look at me talking history. But anyway, with all this disposable income, the kids needed to be entertained. And instead of just having radio programs to listen to, now kids have comic books. It was not uncommon during the golden age for books to sell upwards of a million copies. That's just how popular comics were. Now, of course, after the war, you know, comic sales kind of decline a little bit and you started to get other types of books popping up, horror books and uh, books with more adult themes. You know, everybody was getting into comics. It kind of became more of a, you know, maybe cottage industry, if you could call it that. Now, that all kind of gets reborn in the Silver Age of comics. Now, comics are certainly popular. They don't necessarily lose popularity the way they will later in the 90s, but because of how popular they are, they're of course the topic or the subject of a lot of scrutiny. 
And in 1954, there's a book that's released called The Seduction of the Innocent, where a child psychologist basically blames all the ills of society on comic books. Now, the outrage from this is pretty big. It's pretty significant. Uh, I mean, this is literally the subject of congressional hearings. Do comics lead to juvenile delinquency? Are Batman and Robin in a gay relationship? Uh, is Wonder Woman just the object of some people's weird fetish desires? All of these are questions that are raised in this book. Um, and if you ask the author, the answer to all those questions was yes. Now, like I said, this became this caused a big uproar. Now, if you're a 90s kid, this is pretty much just like when we were all little and Harry Potter and Pokemon were like the bane of every preacher's existence. Yeah, I lived through that. But anyway, so the seduction of the innocent really kind of shines a light on what all is going on in comics. Now people are concerned and the industry was concerned that Congress would shut them down. And even though that didn't end up happening, they created what's known as the Comics Code Authority, which basically highlights a bunch of things that can and cannot be in comic books. So with the introduction of the Comics Code Authority, all of a sudden, it's time to go back to safer storytelling. And that sort of brings on the Silver Age. Now, before we talk about the next era of comics, I've got to give a shout out to our channel sponsor, Organic Price Books. Organic Price Books is the best place to look for collected editions. I'm talking trade paperbacks, omnibus, oversized hardcovers, which are really the best way to read some of these gold and silver and even bronze age stories because these books get super expensive if you're trying to buy them in single issues. So take a look at their website, browse the shelves. There's new books coming out every single week. And if you see something you like, go ahead and place that order. Now, if you're looking for a discount, I can help you out with that. Just say my name at checkout, enter the coupon code BJKICKS, all one word, no spaces, and you'll save $2 off every order, every time. So shout out to Organic Price Books. Like I said, the best place to look for off the hook books. And now let's keep talking about comic book eras. Now, the Silver Age of comics, um, people would say, lasted from 1956 until about 1970. And what sparks the Silver Age in most comic historians' brains is the uh, introduction of Showcase Number 4. That book, or the release of Showcase Number 4, which introduces us to a brand new Flash, Barry Allen. Now, Barry Allen obviously is one of the most popular Flashes, right? Um, I mean, when you think of the Flash, you think Barry Allen, or you think Wally West, who came much later. Um, but... Barry Allen kind of introduces a new type of Flash, a younger, um, more fun superhero, right? And with this introduction of Barry Allen comes, like I said, another rise in the popularity of superheroes. All of a sudden, everybody wants to cash in. In 1961, you get the introduction of the Justice League of America. At the same time or around the same time, um, a company known as Timely Comics changes its name to Marvel and well, the rest is history. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby introduce all sorts of superheroes into the world. In August 1961, which we're actually in the 60th anniversary of as I record this video, we get Fantastic Four number one, a really cool superhero team with, you know, Invisible, though the Invisible Girl and Mr. Fantastic, the stretchy dude, the Thing, who's my favorite, and of course, Johnny Storm. So you get reintroductions of different ideas of heroes that were in comics in years past, right? Johnny Storm was not the first Human Torch, but um, they're cooler, they're more fun, and they're more action-packed, and people are really, really enjoying them. So not only do you get the Justice League and the Fantastic Four, but Marvel, or like I said, Stan and Jack just go on a run, introducing all types of characters, the Avengers, Thor, The Incredible Hulk, Spider-Man debuts in 1962, and this is pretty much what or why we consider it or what's considered the Silver Age, right? So we get all these heroes, we get all these really cool um, stories. Uh, like I said, the X-Men, Spider-Man, I mean, this is pretty much when superheroes become 
what we know them as today. They're not just super campy or a joke. Um, although in the Silver Age, there's plenty of camp to go around. Uh, let's not even talk about Zebra Batman, right? Lots of camp to go around, um, but it's really, really cool. And like I said, the Comics Code Authority is really strict on what can be in comics and what can't. And so it kind of keeps the whole industry a little bit more lighthearted until they start to, or until um, publishers start to kind of abandon the Comics Code Authority a little bit later on. Fun fact, DC does not fully abandon the Comics Code Authority until 2011, but I'm skipping ahead. So the Silver Age lasts from about 1956 to about 1970 and is followed immediately by the Bronze Age. So the Bronze Age lasts from 1970 to about 1985. And if we have to categorize or characterize the Bronze Age by one thing, it's more serious storytelling. It's not quite as dark as the stuff you'll get later in the 80s. But it's definitely more serious, right? In 1963, uh, Marvel just, or 1973, excuse me, Marvel surprises everyone with the death of Gwen Stacy and the death of the Green Goblin. And we got to figure out, or Peter Parker has to sort of reckon with himself. He may not even want to be a superhero anymore. So all of a sudden, comics are a lot more serious. Um, artists or uh, authors like Denny O'Neill come to prominence in this time, and they do stories that are a lot more politically themed, right? Uh, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, issue 76, of course, is super popular uh, for bringing up race relations in comics. Uh, but there are comics about all sorts of things. Uh, Speedy gets addicted to drugs, and there's just comics about that. Like I said, there's a lot of comics about more political, more adult themes. Um, and comics at this time really become um, a serious medium. People start to respect it as a serious medium. And for my taste, this is really where uh, comics become bearable. Now, not only do you get more serious and political comics, and uh, you also get the real rise of a lot of books that um, become the things that we know them to be now. So this is when Chris Claremont starts his run on the X-Men, which, by the way, starts in the Bronze Age and ends in the Modern Age. Like That's how long Chris Claremont's run on X-Men is. But yeah, so if we're going to think of the Bronze Age as anything, we're going to think of it as the time period that really made comics legitimate. They're finally cool. Not cool but definitely serious, legitimate. People see them as serious works of literature, which is actually very interesting. When you think about like the golden age stories and silver age stories and how campy, it's like, it's like comparing Scooby-Doo to something like the boondocks or something, right? Like it's just, it's a whole different world. But anyway, the bronze age of comics, like I said, lasts from about 1970 to about 1985. Now, Comic historians are actually kind of split on what happens after 1985. Some, or I would say most, would say that 1985 starts the modern era. But others would actually define the years from 1985 to about 1991 as the Copper Age. And I like this distinction because there are some really significant things that happen during the Copper Age of comics. So like I said, the comics or the Copper Age is from about 1984, 1985 until about 1991. So the Copper Age is really defined by being a dark and gritty age of storytelling. And there's really three writers that we can kind of attribute a lot of that to. Alan Moore, Frank Miller, and Denny O'Neill to a lesser extent. But all of these people are responsible for making comics darker, more serious, more adult-oriented, and really setting the tone that really has lasted into comics even into now, so over the last 40 years. Uh, so books like Watchmen that Alan Moore does that really offer a more dark, twisted, subversive side of what superhero comics could be, right? Um, Watchmen is literally like one of the most acclaimed novels of all time, graphic or not. I still haven't read it, but that's not the point. 
But another thing that happens in the Copper Age um, is you get a lot of events. So DC does the Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985, which basically condenses all their history into one uh, seemingly manageable timeline. Although all the different crisis events since 1985 kind of show it's still convoluted. It's still convoluted. But anyway, um, because DC decided to blow up all their continuity, you get a lot of re-entry points for a lot of your favorite characters. Um, and a lot of them are really, are, are a lot much darker reimaginings of these characters. So um, with Batman, you get Batman Year One by Frank Miller. Um, you also end up getting The Dark Knight Returns. Um, you get Alan Moore's Watchmen. Um, and like I said, Danny O'Neill is still making characters <laughs> dark. He's editing Batman well into the 80s. Um, and beyond that, he's also doing The Question with Dennis Cowan late into the or in the late 80s, uh, all the way into like the early 90s. There's just really a lot of dark, gritty storytelling. Think Moon Knight. Uh, by Doug Minch. Think The Punisher. You get the rise of all these anti-heroes, right? Uh, the popularity of Wolverine skyrockets during this time period. Speaking of Wolverine, Chris Claremont's X-Men spins out into so many other books during this time. New Mutants, Excalibur. Um, you get a bunch of events, uh, or X-Men events. Uh, there's a lot of really cool things that happen in the Copper Age. So, like I said, for me, the Bronze Age is really where comics start to become comics. But I think the Copper Age, if you make that distinction, really sets the stage for what comics are going to be really long into the future. And now toward the end of the Copper Age, you get these movies. Now, back in 1978, we get the first Superman movie. It does all right. Um, and so comics become a little bit more popular because of the movie. And then in 1989, you get the Tim Burton Batman movie starring Michael Keaton. The fact that we're getting Michael Keaton as Batman in 2021 is a whole different thing. But anyway, you get the 1989 Batman movie. And so now comic books are starting to see, be seen as popular in other media as well. Uh, lunchboxes, toys, everything is super, super popular. And that leads us into the speculator boom of the 90s and ushers us in to the modern era. Now, the modern era, most people would say, started in 1991 and continues all the way up through now. Who knows? Maybe historians will say the modern era stopped at a certain point and call this time period something else long after I'm dead. But anyway, so the modern era starts in 1991 if you keep the copper age as a distinction. Um, and it's really marked by just huge highs. The modern era is where comics reach their peak. I mean, you really can't talk about the modern era without talking about superstar artists, all birthed or raised at Marvel, basically. Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, and Rob Liefeld, right? The three of them have some of the three or some of the highest selling comics of all time. Jim Lee is the one who reaches the peak, selling 7.5 million copies of X-Men number one with Chris Claremont, still holding the record for the best-selling comic of all time. But Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man number one also sells a ridiculous amount of copies. New Mutants sells a ridiculous amount of copies with the introduction of Cable and X-Force and or X-Force number one, excuse me, sells millions of copies, which kind of spins out of New Mutants. So these three really take Marvel Comics to new heights. Now, it doesn't hurt that Marvel had a bunch of other things going on as well. Variant covers, gimmicks, trading cards, really taking advantage of the collector's market. Well, people are seeing that comics are selling all these different copies um, and people at the same time are selling off old copies or old comics for thousands of dollars right now. To put this in perspective, this is in the middle, like the dot com boom and everything. All this all this money is just flooding through the United States. And when we get money, we spend it on ridiculous things like comic books. And so. 
people who have no familiarity with the hobby at all see all of these series launching, they see all these gimmick covers, and they're like, ooh, I'm going to cash in on that. And so that basically starts what we call the speculator bubble. All these people kind of throwing their money and throwing their money into comic books, hoping that it'll pan out one day. It didn't pan out. It didn't. It, it didn't pan out at all. And so you basically had a crash that happens in the mid to late 90s. Um, a lot of comic, comic book publishers started up in this time. So like I said, uh, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, and a few others, Mark Silvestri, Jim Valentino, and so on. They leave Marvel Comics at the height of their success in 1992 and start their own company called Image. And Image is just known for it's just like super buff dudes and super like sexy ladies. Like it's just everything that people love about 90s comics can really be found at Image. And like I said, they launched their own new titles, Spawn. Young Blood, Wildcats, all of these books get their start then, but they're not the only ones that were doing independent comics. Um, my favorite publisher, Milestone Media, also starts in 1992, although they don't publish their first books until 93, right? So you get a lot of people kind of starting new things, investing in the comic book industry. But like I said, in the late 90s, it all comes to a crash. By 1997, my com my favorite company, Milestone, has stopped publishing entirely, right? And they're not the only ones to be lost to the speculator bubble in comics. Um, now, a few other things happen during this time period. You get the rise of the direct market and dedicated comic book shops. Um, you get a lot of things happening consolidated distribution, things that don't really matter. What you really are here for is what comics are, are really good. So like I said, X-Men number one, X-Force number one, uh, Spider-Man number one, right? Those are like modern comics that, you know, we all know and love. Wildcats and so on, right? And like I said, the modern era continues all the way up till now. Now, in the mid to late 2000s, we get all sorts of things happening, right? In 2011, DC rebooted their entire universe again with the new 52 and literally start every title over at issue number one. So including, or I think except for Action Comics and Detective Comics, those later went back to legacy numbering. But everything else gets rebooted with issue number ones, uh, which is really cool. Um, sometime after that, Marvel tries to do the same thing with Marvel now. They don't reboot all their titles, but they do add a bunch of new characters or change a bunch of characters that you knew from the past to varying degrees of success. Uh, we get the introduction of characters like Miles Morales um, and uh, Miss Marvel. You get a lot of people in comics. And so in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years of comics, we're starting to see a lot more diversity. Now, you're also seeing, in included with the rise of diversity in comics, you're also seeing um, a huge amount of comics being made and written really for the screen, right? The MCU starts in 2009 with the release of Iron Man and becomes a multi-billion dollar movie franchise. And right now, I would say comics are hotter than they've ever been. Now, it hasn't necessarily translated to sales of comic books, right? It, 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 most people would agree that it's a dying format, although I don't think it's dying anytime soon. But what we all can agree on is a lot of the hottest properties in Hollywood have gotten their start as comic books. Mark Miller's uh, Jupiter's Legacy on Netflix, um, Kick-Ass before that, Wanted, Kingsman, right? All of those stem from one comic book creator. Frank Miller had Sin City. Uh, Watchmen became a movie in 2009. Um, like I said, everything in the MCU, uh, the DC animated universe, the DC extended universe, comics are basically being seen as a breeding ground for stories that can later be picked up by these parent companies and turned into multi-million dollar or hopefully billion dollar movie franchises. And that's pretty much where we are today. So for me, and I've said this several times throughout this video, for me, my comic taste, um, comics really don't become comics for me until the bronze age or maybe even the copper age, depending on what distinctions you make. 
But I know plenty of people that collect golden and silver age books because they love them. And now with the rise of like digital services like Comixology, Marvel Unlimited, DC Universe, you can read these stories from the comfort of your own home, on your computer screen, on your phone, or even on your tablet. And now you have access to all of these different stories. And so I would encourage you to get on one of those apps and just look at Bronze Age comics one day. Look at Silver Age comics one day. Figure out which ones you like the best and which ones would go well for the collection that you're curating. I would love to know in the comments of this post, if you've made it this far, which books you love uh, out of this or which era you love. What do you love collecting? Are you a Silver Age guy? Are you a Modern Age guy like me? I got to know. So let me know in the comments below. While you're there, you can definitely join um, the K Squad, which is my private group on Facebook, where we talk about comics and have nerdy discussion all the time. Um, but I hope to see you there. And until then, hope you saw something you liked in this video. If not, hey, that's cool. So you can always buy what you like. Just make sure you read what you buy and uh, be nice to others because kindness makes the world go round.